Chobani's mission to provide better food for more people is what guides them. From every cup to every creation, they believe every food maker shares the same responsibility, which is why they ensure their food is made transparently, honestly, and with only natural ingredients. Today's food service climate is ever-changing, but Chobani's wholesome and nutritious offerings are up to the task, whether it's refreshing your menu or preparing dine-in dishes for takeout. From Chobani Kitchens to yours, the inspiration is unlocked to support your innovation for endless, better for you possibilities. Thank you to Chobani and thank you all for joining us today from across the globe for this important culinary presentation. Now, more than ever, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship. Before we begin, as a note, we will be taking questions from you, the viewers, as we are able. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other viewers and the Q&A function to pose questions to the chef. So let's get the chat going. Uh, we'd love to hear where you're tuning in from, so please use that chat function. I'm Jackie Pressinger. American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I'm honored to introduce our moderator today, a friend, a colleague, and a very talented young culinarian. Chef Ashton Garrett is president of the American Culinary Federation's Young Chefs Club, which includes all ACF members under the age of 25. He's also the USA's Young Chefs Ambassador to the World Association of Chef Societies. And I could go on and on, but Chef Ashton, I'm gonna pass it over to you to say a few words about yourself and also to welcome our special guest chef. So thank you. Sure, thank you, Jackie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is an honor to be here today with you and we welcome you all to this fantastic presentation with Chef Ashford. Uh, again, my name is Ashton Garrett and I currently serve as the ACF Young Chefs Club National President. Um, throughout my career, I, ha I have had tremendous uh, and blessed opportunities to work alongside phenomenal chefs and also cook. Um, in various restaurants and hospitality establishments throughout the world. Um, and much like those great chefs, we have a wonderful chef, a phenomenal chef presenting with us today uh, within Chef Ashford. Uh, before I turn it over to Chef, um, I'm going to launch a poll here. I'm asking everyone, all our viewers, um, if, they've, if they've ever experienced or made or uh, eaten uh, any dishes that were inspired by African cuisine. Uh, so I'm gonna launch it right now. And uh, go ahead and answer that. And then, uh, so while we, while you all answer those questions, Chef, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And uh, if you would just like to uh, say a little thing, say, say a little bit about yourself, uh, your restaurant establishment um, and, and who you are as a chef. So thank you for, for being on this presentation with us today. And uh, we look forward to see what, what you'll be demonstrating. Good afternoon, everybody. How you, how, how's everybody doing today? Uh, my name is uh, Kenyatta Ashford. Uh, you are here in our kitchen at Neutral Ground in downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee. We are one of the restaurants and residents here at the Proof Bar Incubator. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, my experience and my observations and learning while traveling to West Africa and uh, throughout the United States, learning about uh, cookery of the African American diaspora. Um, today, the dish we want to prepare for you is uh, one that I uh, got a chance to partake in while, while in Ghana. Uh, it's a dish of uh, stewed black eyed peas made with palm oil, um, tomato, and a few other ingredients. Um, and it's called West African Red Red. Uh, we're going to serve, we're going to make our dish today with uh, coconut rice, uh, some fried plantains, fried sweet plantains and, um, and uh, salsa criolla. And uh, a little bit about my background. I'm a graduate from the Culinary Institute of America uh, in Hyde Park, New York. Uh, I'm originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. And um, I was trained as a, classically trained and learned quite a bit about uh, French cookery uh, throughout my career and then the culinary school but really had a strong desire to learn about the cuisine of my ancestry, uh, which wasn't taught in culinary school. And there aren't really any, many places that you can go to learn about that cuisine. So I really had a passion and sought out uh, to discover and learn more about that cuisine. And hence, I am, I'm, I'm here today 
uh, with you guys on ACF uh, doing a demo about uh, West African cookery. So um, I'm really excited to be with you guys today and um, uh, let's proceed. Uh, so I'm gonna go over some, some of the ingredients that we're gonna use uh, to, to make this dish. You know, i.e., you know, black eyed peas. Uh, we have some soaked black eyed peas here, or cow peas and everything. And it's important to soak your black eyed peas because, because you want them to be fully hydrated so they can cook evenly. You don't want to cook your peas and then have some peas that are hard and some peas that are soft. So it's really important to rehydrate your, your dry peas to make sure that you, they cook evenly and everything. And um, it, it makes a difference in a dish. Uh, then uh, we're going to use uh, some mirepoix, uh, red bell pepper, celery, red bell pepper and celery, uh, some uh, diced onion. Uh, we're going to use some uh, sliced red onion for the salsa criolla, uh, some minced garlic, um, and uh, a few other ingredients I'm, I'm going to demo right now. So one of the first things that we, we do when uh, one of the base flavors for making uh, red red, uh, what, from what I've learned in my observation and travel to, uh, to Ghana, is they take, they take uh, onion, garlic, and ginger and they don't necessarily dice it or do it like you might find in western cookery they take it and make a puree or we call it here in our kitchen a slurry and uh, they take it puree it all together uh almost um and it's minced really fine and they use that as a base to begin all of the cookery that i that i was able to uh see while i was in ghana so first thing we want to do is want to take about two onions two large onions uh, about this much ginger, about two inches of ginger, and maybe 10 cloves of peeled garlic. And we're gonna take that and put it into the Vitamix and blend it until it becomes liquefied. And you can break your ginger up. You can even slice it up a little bit, but uh, Vitamix is gonna take care of most of that for us, everything. Uh, and the reason why I'm not peeling the ginger because this ginger is organic. Um, and it's no, no need to wash it because you know, it's uh, been, been grown properly. Chef, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So just, just to be clear for our viewers, what all is going into the Vitamix right now? So we have uh, two, uh, two onions, 10 cloves of garlic, and about two, a two inch finger of ginger, uh, organic ginger. And we're mm -hmm. gonna puree that until it becomes, it becomes liquefied, until it becomes a, a slurry in a sense. Hold on one second. And Chef, are you adding any liquid to this? I'm not adding any liquid to it. I'm just going to uh, push it down until it catches the blade sure. of the, uh, of the uh, blender. And it'll, it'll, uh, all the water will come out of the onions and the vegetables. Wonderful. And Chef, so you know, uh, our poll has done an amazing, uh, in terms of progress, it's an amazing job, I should say, in terms of progress. Over 71% of our viewers um, have said that they love uh, African cuisine uh, within their dishes and, you know, that they've tried different things. So um, it's definitely, a, you know, a staple uh, cuisine, I think, um, in terms of that. So um, I, as you're doing that, I kind of would like to ask you um, if you could recall a story as to uh, some inspirations that you've had were creating some dishes, um, maybe in your restaurant or even at home that have inspired, you know, from African cuisine. Uh, one of the things that I, um, I learned about um, it was surprising, but, but I think it shouldn't have been. But uh, one of the things I, I, I observed and noticed is um, Ghana is 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 on the uh, is borders the Atlantic Ocean. Sure. And we spent a lot of time on the coast in some places and everything. And seafood is such a, a huge part of the of the diet in, in Ghana. Uh, they fish. 
for all sorts of things, octopus, um, white bait, you know, perch, tilapia, all sorts of seafood. And the seafood is so abundant. Um, and one of the ways that they use it as a way, a means of commerce to make money and to feed themselves is they take all the, all the catch that they have, they, they save some obviously for themselves and they take it, they dry it out in the sun and they smoke it. And one of the ways that they use that uh, in cooking is they take the smoked fish and they add it to, to, to different things as a, as a flavoring agent or as a seasoning. And I, uh, I've uh, really embraced that quite a bit. And it kind of, it was, it seemed really familiar to me because using dried fish uh, was something that I grew up doing uh, in New Orleans when my mom would make gumbo or my grandmother would make gumbo, we would always take the, the dry shrimp and put it in the gumbo to give it some extra oom. Right. Yeah. And that that dried, so basically it's like a dehydrated, like more, more so to speak. Yeah. The, the, what, I, what I saw them doing in, in, uh, in Ghana was they, they smoked it. Now right. the, 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 the stuff that we use at home was just dried, but the smoking as, a, a, as an additional element of flavor to, to the seafood, mm. you know, it has uh, lots of depth. And Chef, we had a question about that. Um, you can continue. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, was the, uh, the fish cold or hot smoked? It was hot smoked. Hot smoked. Yes. Wonderful. And so you're pureeing, you pureed the onions, the ginger. Chef, can you hear me? So we're done with that. And okay. essentially, you want your puree to, to come out like this, right? And this is what we're going to use to, to make the gravy for the black eyed peas and also to, to cook our coconut rice. And Chef Astrid, we have another question coming in from a chat. Um, thank you to all our viewers for asking these questions um, for Chef. Please keep them coming throughout the, the entire presentation. Um, Chef, you mentioned that you use palm oil. Is there another oil that you can use instead of palm oil? Chef, we have lost your audio, unfortunately. It looks like your mobile device is offline. This is Matt, the producer, by the way. You don't generally hear me unless something goes a little wonky, which it often does, because that's the world of Zoom. There's Chef again. Do you read a Chef? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, Chef. No. So we just had a question, Chef, in terms of the palm oil. Um, is there a substitute instead of the palm oil that you can use for this recipe? Um, you, you can use olive oil. Um, olive oil would, would, would be suitable. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to, to, to get palm oil. Um, I, I think palm oil in West Africa is akin to olive oil to in, in the Mediterranean. Sure. So you might, you might, Think of, about the palm oil and all the other all the negative things that you've heard about palm oil and how they do it in Southeast Asia with the monocultures and and clear cutting forests and things like that. The palm oil of West Africa is different, or the palm trees, the palm oil trees in West Africa are different than the uh, the palm the palm oil that you might find in um, in Malaysia or Indonesia. So this is palm oil. It's red and it's full of uh, antioxidants and really healthy things. Uh, it has a really unique flavor and um, you can't simply, you simply can't make red red, you know, hence the red color of the oil without using palm oil. And it's easy to source now because you can buy everything on Amazon. So right. if you want to get some palm oil, you can buy it on Amazon if you, if you Google it. Almost anything can be bought on Amazon these days, that's for sure, especially food. I can't hear him. I can hear you now, Ashton. I, I think oh, no, my I mean, volume went down. 
Oh, you're fine, Chef. No, I was I was just saying, you know, almost anything can be bought on Amazon these days, um, with the, especially, you know, food, um, especially with their merger with Whole Foods and everything. So, uh, so Chef, yeah. now, now, now let's see what, what are you, what are you working on now? Uh, right now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, the coconut rice and uh, we're going to take some of the slurry that we made and uh, we're going to put a bit of it in the pan with, uh, with some oil. Uh, the pan is hot right now. And this serves the purpose as you're making the rice crispy, correct? So we put about a cup of uh, the, the ginger, garlic, and onion puree in a pan. We'll let that sweat just for a second and uh, on low heat. And uh, we're talking about rice. Um, one of the things that, that's cool about uh, rice is uh, it's cheap and it's um, very flavorful. Rice and beans are really cool too because them by themselves, uh, they're pretty ordinary. But when you combine them, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, you get the same protein contents that you were eating meat. Uh, they complement each other very well. So rice and, rice and peas or beans are a great substitute uh, for, for somebody who's on a meat-free diet or who's vegan or vegetarian. Um, and the other thing too is when, whenever you want to cook rice, you want to cook rice, um, especially in, a, in the method that my ancestors would cook rice is you always want to wash your rice to get some of the extra starch off it. It's something, something that my mom always did before she cooked her rice. She was really particular about the way she cooked her rice and everything. And you have to wash the rice and make sure you get the starch off, off of it. So when the rice is cooked, you can, uh, you can fluff it up and get your individual grains. But here we have about a quarter of rice and we're going to um, add it to our pot with the ginger and um, ginger and garlic and uh, onion. I'm gonna stir it up just a little bit. And uh, we're gonna add a little salt at this point and this is uh, jasmine rice, and we're going to cook it at a, a one to one and a half ratio with coconut milk and water. And chef, so that, that rice is being cooked much like a, like a pilaf method then, but instead of regular stock, you're using like that coconut milk as you, as you alluded to? Yes, we're gonna use coconut milk. Um, coconut milk imparts a a really, uh, really good flavor. It has some sweetness to the rice and uh, lots of aromatics. Lots of aroma, ar aroma to the rice and everything. I think uh, because uh, coconuts are so um, so abundant in West Africa and in the Caribbean and stuff, you know, it's just a, a common thing to, to make rice with coconut. Certainly. And we, uh, this is our, our take on, on, uh, on coconut rice. Chef, you did mention, you know, rice and how that's such a staple, um, you know, with, especially in African cuisines, um, as it is around the world. You know, they, so many different cuisines and cultures um, in certain regions, you know, use different variations of rice. Um, what rice do you more commonly see down in, you know, in, in Western Africa or even in the African cuisine? You know, you mentioned that you use jasmine rice for this particular recipe. But, you know, are there any other rices or any other grains, you know, such as farro or bulgur or, you know, any other things that are, that, that could substitute for this rice? Um, there, there is. Uh, fiono is, is one of the grains that I learned about uh, while in Africa. And it is, um, it's uh, a, a form of millet, I believe. Sure. And it's a, it's a grain that uh, Chef Pierre and Tim is uh, trying to introduce to, to the, uh, the American consumer uh, and make it, a, make it a thing where people can start to uh, buy more here because, and make it popular like you would uh, and kind of make the, make the craze 
like people uh, did when Team Wild was introduced uh, to America. Um, Piano is a is a, a really good grain because it has uh, tons and tons of nutrients. It's called a super grain, uh, just like quinoa is. Uh, another grain or another uh, starch that was uh, common in uh, in Ghana and in Benin was um, cassava and uh, yam. And when you talk about yam, we're not talking about the same kind of yam that we that we uh, normally associate with that word here in the United States. The yam that they use is a, is is the uh, is a real yam. It's, it's a white flesh potato uh, that's really starchy, and they prepare that in several ways. They usually they make a uh, fufu uh, with the uh, with the yam. They also use corn a lot, which corn is not indigenous to West Africa. It was brought brought back over by the conquistadors and the Colombian uh, Colombian inter, in, exchange uh, back in the uh, the 15th century. Uh, along with tomatoes. But um, fiono, uh, yam, and cassava are, are some of the things, uh, some of the starches that are common in West Africa. Oh. We're going to add a little salt to our rice. And we're going to let this come to a simmer and then we'll we'll cover that. And uh, next we'll start uh, cooking our, our black eyed peas. And we're simply going to take uh, some onion and some celery and carrot and uh, sort of use that to infuse some vegetable flavor into the peas and into the broth as well. It's going to rough chop those. Uh, so we'll start with some celery. And about five cloves of garlic. We'll just take those and smash them. And this is that organic garlic that you said, Chef? No, this is this is just regular run of the meal garlic. We were using organic ginger. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. And Chef, um, we have one of the viewers asked, how much coconut milk did you put into uh, with the rice? It was a... Uh, um, it was maybe a, a 13 and a half a fluid ounce can. And you said the ratio was a one to one, one and a half? Yeah, one to one and a half. Yes, sir. Wonderful. And for our viewers out there, um, we do encourage all our questions. Uh, we ask that you use the Q&A function. Um, the chat is, is more primarily for commentary and opinion. So thank you for that uh, moving forward. Uh, and chef, you know, I kind of want to switch gears now. You did mention, you know, with with the chef that you said that introduced quinoa, you know, as an as an staple with you know with American cuisine, um, and how that's kind of taken off as a superfood. Uh, where do you see, you know, the Western African or just African cuisine, you know? And I, I, it's kind of a two two part question. So, where do you see it going in the future? And also, why isn't as why isn't it as celebrated as other cuisines? You know, such as French and Italian and you know Chinese and you know um, where are the basis of many of those cu cuisines originated? You know, through the trades and um, the conquistadors, as you said. So, if you could just speak to that, I think we would all be very interested. Um, I think that's a that's a good question. Actually, um, there's there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, our history as, as a country. Sure. Uh, how undervalued people of color have been. And, and uh, it really uh, really says a lot too, because there is, there's been a, a real emergence of chefs of color, African-American chefs, beginning to come to the forefront and uh, be able to stay, take center stage and talk about their ancestry and their cuisine and uh, the cuisine that their grandmothers and their ancestry. So I think hopefully that should continue because there's lots of uh, things that have been talked about. And I think that's one of the cuisines in one of the countries as far as culinary arts that really hasn't been explored too deeply. And there's lots, there's lots to discover in Africa. You know, Africa is a continent and they're so many countries in Africa and so many different regionalities and so many different regional cuisines 
that um, you can go for years and years and still do so much discovery about different cuisines. So I think it's the newest thing around, but I think uh, it's been around for a long time and I think people are just, I don't know, man. <laughs> sure, no, no, and yeah. that's, it's, it, it is a tricky question, you know, like, yeah. um, a lot of my colleagues and, uh, you know, friends and uh, from different parts of the world, you know, kind of ask, ask me that question. And I myself, you know, I, I couldn't answer it. You know, I'm still on, on the teeter totter myself, you know, and I think it's uh, a lot, like you said, you know, it's a lot of discovery, you know, as chefs, part of our job and what makes our job so fun is that we're able to, you know, dig deep into different cuisines and kind of merge the two, if we wish, you know, with fusion and different things like that and find ingredients that really inspire us. So um, that ex uh, exploration, as you mentioned, when you went to Ghana, you know, and how that inspired you to kind of, you know, uh, create different dishes and uh, research your history more. Um, I think a lot of chefs, uh, especially the younger generation, uh, can use that information moving forward. Um, so thank you for that, 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 chef. Thank you. So we do have a, a quick question, chef. They want to know, um, is rice fattening? Is the grain rice fattening? Uh, rice doesn't have any fat content as far as I know. Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think so. Rice doesn't have, it has lots of minerals and vitamins and things like that. Uh, especially when you eat rice that's unadulterated as far as being processed. And being uh, stripped of his uh, of his fiber and and uh, hull and, and things like that, uh, but rice, as far as I know, doesn't have any fat besides what you add to it. Sure. Yeah. And so, chef, what, what was that that you just added? So, uh, in the pot here, you now it's covered up with the black eyed peas now. But black eyed peas, okay. Um, you have onion, garlic, celery, some carrot, bay leaf, and the bundle of thyme. And uh, that will uh, we'll cook that until it comes to a simmer. Chef, do you mind putting some water in for me? There you go. Thank you, chef. Uh, and it's uh, you have a bundle of thyme in there, and um, we'll cover this with water and season it just a, a little bit with some salt, and we'll let it cook on a slow, slow simmer okay. until uh, they're nice and tender. And what we'll do is once the beans are, we taste the beans and they're tender, we'll uh, strain it and reserve the liquid because the liquid, liquid is what we'll use to make the gravy for the red red. A lot of flavor components going on in there, chef. Yeah, lots of flavor. That's what it's about, man. All about flavor. Uh, chef, you mentioned, you know, um, you know, coming from New Orleans, how much inspiration, um, you know, does did that have in terms of, you know, creating menus, uh, different ingredients, finding different ingredients, you know, reaching out to different networks. Um, you know, we hear New Orleans as, you know, a culinary Mecca in particular to, you know, French Creole cuisine and Western African cuisine. So how much did that play an in inspiration uh, into your, your culinary prowess now? Um, it played a lot uh, because so much so, you know, um, my, my ancestry is very important to me. So when I went to Ghana, I took my first trip to, to Africa and I went to Ghana, uh, part, of the, the, part of what I did when I returned home was to uh, do, you know, trace my genealogy. So I did sure. the, the ancestry.com uh, uh, DNA test. Right. And I, I began to uh, research my genealogy and try to find uh, where my forefathers and foremothers came from. Uh, and also, uh, food is one political. Food, you no, know, has a lot to do with anthropo anthropology and history. When you can, we can, when you can find out or discover um, what pe pe people ate, you can, you can find out a lot about who they were, their their religious beliefs, and their cultural practices. So, food, you no, know, says a lot about people in general. Um, like for instance, uh, right now we're in Lenten season and uh, lots of people give up meat and they eat lots of fried fish uh, during the Lenten season, especially on Fridays. You know, it's a big tradition in Louisiana and um, because Louisiana is a predominantly Catholic uh, state and New Orleans is a predominantly Catholic city. 
you know, uh, so those things are, are key to finding out and discovering one, lots of our differences and even more so about the things that we have in common. And I think food is a powerful thing uh, that we can use as a tool to bring more people together and find out more about what we have in common than we do have than, than we do than we have different about ourselves. Certainly, Chef, and uh, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And you said something very interesting. You said food is a power. Food is a powerful tool. I um, mean, you know, it, it more than anything can bring us all together. I um, mean, Chef, you know, I want to ask you, and if you can recall, um, what did that genealogy tell you about, you know, uh, who you were as, as a person and, and who you become as a chef in terms of your family? Is that a 15 minute timer? Um, it, it let me uh, find out um, um, more about where my grandmother came from. And I was interested in where my brother, grandmother came from so I could find out more about the food that she ate and, and just about, you know, tell me, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess people always want to know what, where, they, where they're from and, 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 and who, who why, they, why they are who they are. And for African-Americans, that's been a, a big piece of the puzzle that's missing. Uh, for us living in the United States, because a lot of our history is unknown. Absolutely. So we we have our coconut rice. It came to a simmer, and we're going to cover that and let it cook for about fifteen minutes. And then we have our black eyed peas um, that are going to come to a simmer as well. Now we have. Um, um, a few other things that we're going to do. Um, so once we, once the rice is done, we'll demo the, the finished dish. And that's going to take about 15 minutes. So right now will be a good time, Ashton, uh, to load me up with questions. Certainly, not a problem. And uh, yeah. so you know, Chef, we have about 25 minutes left in this presentation, and we okay. thank you. We thank you and your team for all that you're doing. Uh, I wish I was in the kitchen myself, helping you guys out and, and cooking some more. So we do have a question, um, a very interesting question. Um, that a viewer wants to know: Why is your restaurant called Neutral Ground? Good question. Um, so my restaurant is called Neutral Ground uh, because. Um, if you've ever been to New Orleans, um, you, you, New Orleans is a very interesting place. It has a really unique history. Absolutely. And the neutral ground in New Orleans will be considered the median anywhere else. Uh, so the name neutral ground comes from a long time ago when the city was kind of divided. You know, uh, the French still occupy the, the current day French Quarter. And the uh, Americans or the Anglos live on the opposite side of the street, on, uh, on Canal Street. Uh, and that was called the American sector. Culturally, politically, those two groups of people didn't get along. So the neutral ground was the place where people came together or the common place where people came together to kind of settle differences. And we want to, we would like to consider our restaurant as a place where people can have a good meal and find something common about themselves to talk about, have a night, have a, have a good meal and set aside the differences. Um, also, the neutral ground is significant for several other reasons in Louisiana. You know, it's, the, it's one of the places where everybody goes to uh, scout out their spots on, for the parade routes on Mardi Gras and, and whatnot. And also, um, it, it, it's, it plays a big part in the history of, in, in Louisiana uh, because, because of those, those two examples that I gave. So the, French, the French people and the Anglos didn't get along and um, culturally had lots of differences. So that, that kind of that sums it up. Wow. I, I myself, you know, I, I've traveled to New Orleans uh, just, just one time and I can attest that is a pretty magical place um it definitely more so you know from the food and, and the historical presence um and that's a very interesting point that you made about you know why it's it's neutral ground and to your point you know 
as you mentioned earlier on in this presentation, that food uh, plays such a, a pivotal role in bringing people together. So um, thank you for that, Chef. We have another question. Um, what about African cuisine impacts on the underrated soul food cuisine? So, um, so yes, what about Afri African cuisine impact on the underrated soul food cuisine? So basically, what I, I, I interpret this person asking is, you know, do you find much difference in classical soul food as it is now um, versus African cuisine in which you're cooking? It may not even be from, a, from an ingredient standpoint, it also could be from like, as you mentioned, a political standpoint as well. Um, I think uh, there's lots of similarities. Uh, that, so I'll, I'll answer that question this way. Um, I thought probably that's the best way I can answer it. So born and raised in New Orleans, you have so many cultural influences and so many culinary influences. Um, New Orleans is, is kind of its own unique entity in Southeast Louisiana uh, because it has influence from the Caribbean uh, as far as you know, uh, Haitian uh, people. Um, African people from other parts of the world, right? Uh, the French, the Spanish, uh, German, Italian, and, and whatnot. So I grew up eating, you no know, rice and beans all the time, um, jambalaya gumbo and things like that. But as you look at the South and as a as a larger region, uh, separate from New Orleans, you have. Uh, collard greens, uh, cornbread, uh, black eyed peas, and things like that. I also grew up eating things that you might find popular here in Chattanooga. Uh, uh, greens with, with smoked pork or barbecue and things of that nature. So my, my upbringing was very unique in the sense that uh, I got to see both sides of, of the culinary landscape as an African-American growing up in New Orleans and also experiencing some of, the, some of the food that you would in other places in the South. Um, soul food is underrated. Uh, and it, a lot of times has, has a negative connotation because people associate it with unhealthy cooking. Certainly. When that's not, not really the case. Right. Um, and what I brought back with me from my time in, in Ghana and Benin is that the cuisine of those places is a very largely vegetable based. Um, just like it probably was, you know, years and years ago before our food systems became really industrialized here in the United States, uh, where you could buy meat so cheaply and you can eat fried chicken every day. Uh, a long time ago, probably when my grandmother was a kid, you, you probably only ate fried chicken on Sundays uh, or for Sunday dinner. Uh, but there's a negative connotation associated with soul food because it's you know, usually associated with being unhealthy because it's, it's fatty, it's greasy, it's unhealthy, it's, it's bad for you. And that's not really the case. It's, it's you know, in West Africa, the food is largely vegetable based. And from what I remember as a kid, you know, uh, in New Orleans, the, the vegetable man would kind of drive around town in his truck and my mom would buy greens. Uh, from him and make for, for dinner. My father grew up in, the, in, the, in rural Louisiana and we had a garden in our backyard as a kid. And we would normally pick um, vegetables from our garden to eat for dinner as well. Uh, so soul food is, is not unhealthy in its original context or even in its, or, or, or in its true context. It's a, a really vegetable for cuisine. And I think, um, it's been misrepresented largely. And Chef, do you see it kind of doing a 180 in terms of having an opportunity for it to be represented in a different way, you know, and allowing chefs such as yourself and, and uh, various other chefs to kind of bring it to that forefront? I think so. I think uh, we can, we have an opportunity to reintroduce our cuisine to, to America and to the world and, sh and show our people uh, a different, so, you know, highlight a cuisine in a different light um, by exploring um, 
our ancestry and the food of our, our, our native land, our native continent. And um, really, you know, exploring all the places where enslaved people were brought to, um, like Brazil and like South America and like Central America and, and like uh, the Caribbean. You know, all of the chefs that are, that are doing wonderful things, you know, whether they have ancestry from Africa or they're from Florida and they ate, you know, chitlins or they ate uh, Oprah prepare it this way. You know, a lot of a lot of us are really beginning to um, show America neo soul food, I guess you would say. Certainly, and chef, you know, the, uh, it brings me to you know a, a quote I always like to recall on it and remember um, is that you know, in terms of being a chef, is that you know, as a chef not only do you have the ability, but you also have the responsibility um, to you know, enlighten your guests, enlighten the world uh, with different cuisines, different ingredients and inspire others to do the same. So uh, we thank you for being a pioneer and we thank you for, for being you know, a trailblazer in that regard. Uh, now, Chef, we have a little bit under 20 minutes left in your presentation and um, the food look is looking really good. Uh, so we have another question. Um, more personal, uh, where do you see yourself in five years, um, just in terms of maybe business, entrepreneurship, or even calling it exploration? Uh, hopefully in five years. Uh, I know that's, the, that's the dreaded question, but yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Ho hopefully in five years, we'll have uh, a brick and mortar a restaurant and uh, lots of guests uh, coming to that brick and mortar restaurant to taste our food. Certainly. Um, hopefully we're in a climate in our country where we have more people open to the cuisines of, uh, of West Africa and just being uh, open to exploring food, more, more different types of food in general. Um, so the, ne the next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna prepare uh, our black eyed peas uh, as our coconut rice finishes, finishes cooking. And I'm gonna first show you how we make our salsa criolla. So we have uh, some red onions that we sliced uh, julienne really thinly. And we have uh, a julienne of mint and cilantro. And we're gonna take some salt and uh, mix that in with the uh, onions, cilantro and mint. And uh, we're gonna take a nice squeeze of lime juice and uh, squeeze that on the, uh, on the onions. And then we're gonna take a little bit of chili oil. Uh, this is a, a, our own recipe for making chili oil. And uh, it's uh, really delicious. And we put, it up, we put it on everything. And um, this is not exactly a traditional way of making uh, salsa criolla, but this is our version. And uh, we really like it. We put it on almost everything that we think needs uh, some brightness and acidity. Uh, we'll stir it up, and what we'll do is uh, we'll top our our finished red red dish with this. And uh, as soon as as soon as uh, the rice is done, uh, which should be in about about uh, ten minutes, seven seven to ten minutes, we'll have uh, we'll plate the dish up. In the meantime, we're going to uh, show you how we do our black eyed peas. So we're going to take some onion. Uh, red bell pepper, uh, celery, and garlic, and we're going to saute that uh, with some palm oil. And that's a uh, minced chef. Those yes, it's, uh, yeah, small, small dice. Okay. And we probably put uh, one part of uh, onion, a half part of uh, bell pepper, and a half part celery in there, and then uh, a pinch of uh, a pinch of garlic. And we're just gonna sweat those down uh, until they get nice and soft. 
And um, then we'll add our black eyed peas and our, our cooking liquid and the beans to that. Okay. All right. Um, so we have some coconut. We're going to do the coconut rice right now as well. Okay. Uh, we put a little canola oil and we put a little coconut oil in there. And the reason why we use both oils is because coconut oil doesn't have a really high smoke point. And we want to get the pan pretty hot in order to, uh, to make the rice crispy. And we don't want to, uh, to burn the coconut oil. So we'll let it heat up. And hey, too, can you take this and uh, let it up for me? So here is the finished coconut rice. We'll, we'll stop and show you that. And what we do with the coconut rice is after it cooks, we take it out of the pot and we uh, somewhat press it down because we want the coconut rice to, as it cools, uh, form, form clumps in the, uh, as it cools down. So when we saute it, you can have nice clusters of rice. Wow. Yeah. That looks that looks great, Chef. And Chef, real quickly, uh, it's just a question uh, I've always wondered. Can you explain the differences between Creole and Cajun cuisine? Uh, <laughs> that's a. Um, no, that's I had to problem. ask you, being from New Orleans, so I, I I wanted to get it straight from the horse's mouth, Chef. Well, they say. Creole cuisine uses lots of tomato and uh, butter because it's more akin to European cooking, sure. i.e. French cooking. And they say Cajun food is more country cooking and more rustic. Um, so that's the basic difference. Now, if you look at specific dishes when it comes to those cuisines, like jambalaya and how they use rice, uh, a lot, you no know, rice is a isn't something that the Acadians you know were accustomed to, to making or growing in their native land of France or in Nova Scotia where they were exiled from by the by the by the British. Sure, uh, rice is a thing that a lot of enslaved Africans were brought to the United States to be able to produce. Rice was a thing that uh, made the, the economy in Charleston, South Carolina one of the richest economies in the United States at, uh, in, in, at the Dome South. So, I mean, there's lots of debate about it and uh, lots of discussion that can be had and stuff, you know, but I don't know, you know, um, but there, that is the basic difference, you know, you no know, Creole cuisine is not, is not, uh, is, is less rustic and uh, Cajun cuisine is more rustic. Okay. So here we have our sauteed uh, mirepoix. I added the black eyed peas and I've added some of the, the cooking liquid from the cooked beans that you see back here. So this right here, we, we drained the peas, we took the, uh, the, cook, the cooking liquid and sweat, down, sweat it down in some uh, tomato paste and uh, the garlic, ginger and onion uh, slurry. We cooked that down and added some of the cooked peas and then pureed it and made this, this liquid. This has palm oil and tomato in it as well. So this is what makes the red, red, red. Wow. Um, so we're gonna let that, we're gonna season the, uh, the red, red with uh, some salt and some Creole spice. And here we're going to um, chef. We have uh, just, we're stir frying our rice. I'm sorry. I say essentially we're we're stir frying our rice. Okay. 
and we, we want it to get uh, a little brown. Uh, and uh, in Spain, when they make paella, you know, they call the crispy rice the sugar rice. So sure. uh, the crispy part at the bottom and everything. And in Africa and Senegal, they uh, they fight over the, the when they make the tabo gin, they fight over the crispy rice at the bottom of the pot. So it's, uh, wow. it's the most uh, part of the rice when you cook it. And Chef, we're uh, a little under 10 minutes. I'm just okay. getting a lot of great questions here. Um, so we have a guest or a viewer, excuse me, that asked, uh, what are traditional cooking methods used in uh, African cuisine? I think uh, the cooking methods are very, very similar to what you will find anywhere else. Uh, they, they, uh, they fry, they saute, um, they braise. Uh, they may not refer to the cooking techniques in those terms, like you would in classical uh, French cooking, but they use the same cooking techniques as you would in any other, any other place. All right, um, so this is, uh, this is done. So now we're gonna plate our dish. Uh, I'm going to uh, fry a plantain and uh, prepare a, a, an avocado for garnish. Uh, Chef, could you explain the differences between a plantain and a uh, and a banana? For some uh, plantains, views? plantains are a lot more starchy. Um, they're a lot different than bananas uh, in that in that sense. Plantains take a lot longer time to ripe. Uh, when you when you uh, give a plantain, if it's yellow, it's not good to eat. In order to well, you, you can eat it, but you can't prepare it. You can't eat it by hand like you would a banana. It would probably taste really starchy and, and, and nasty. The way to prepare a green plantain like that, uh, which um, I was uh, able to discover while I was in Ghana, because people sold fried plantains along the street the entire time, our entire trip, is uh, they fry them and eat them like potato chips, where when you do when you want the sweet flavor from a plantain, you need to get it, let it get ripe and let the skin turn uh, black like you see here. And that is uh, when a plantain uh, has a lot of sweetness in it. And um, you'll uh, be able to uh, get, um, it'll taste like a banana, a similar to a banana. It won't, it won't have all the starchiness. Thank you for that, Chef. Thank you. Yeah, Platanos is, is one of my, my all-time favorites, and plantain is excuse me, a plantain is definitely uh one of my one of my favorite fruits. Um, like you said, very, very sweet. Um, and, and this has a great texture to it. Chef, we, we do have a, a couple more questions um before we, we end uh here. This is great. Thank you for all the viewers uh, submitting your questions. Um Chef, so somebody wants to know, excuse me, a viewer wants to know how you came to uh, to the decision to pick uh, Chattanooga to open your restaurant. Um, my wife, my lovely wife, Miss Tamika Johnson, now Tamika Ashford, uh, we met a long time ago and she's uh, from Chattanooga. So uh, Chattanooga has become, become my home. I've uh, lived in Chattanooga for about, about 20 years now. Off and on, as I moved uh, for different jobs and everything, Chattanooga has always been home base. Wonderful. Wow, Chef, that looks tremendous. <laughs> Do you have a favorite dish that you enjoy cooking or just eating? Do you have a, have a guilty pleasure that you just, you know, Every day in the kitchen, you might want to just whip up. Um, it's interesting because uh, beans and rice are, are a hard combination to beat for me. I grew up uh, and I, I kind of favor red beans and rice just like uh, Louis Armstrong did. Sure. Um, but beans and rice are, are really, really delicious, I think. 
Uh, they really, they really sold. Me. So we have our, our sweet plantains. And we're gonna add our salsa criolla. There, and we're gonna garnish um, this with some uh, some vinny seed. Honestly. And uh, this is the finished product. Uh, West African red red with coconut rice, uh, sweet plantains and avocado. Oh my goodness. Jeff, give yourself a bow. That, that looks tremendous. Wow. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, so we're almost done with this presentation, Chef. So I kind of just want to ask for just a, a small recap and, um, and uh, some words of advice for the, the young chefs here on this call um, and the emerging leaders that are coming up and uh, what we can look forward to from a Western African cuisine perspective here in the future. I, I think uh, you should be looking for uh, more chefs um, of color and just more chefs in general to begin to explore the flavors of, of West Africa and Africa in general. Um, I think there's lots of influence from, from the continent that we have yet to discover in, in the new world, you know, like places in like places, Mexico with Afro, Latinos there and Afro Latinos in the, in the Dominican Republic, the Afro Latinos in Puerto Rico and in South America and Brazil. Uh, I think uh, you'll begin to see more chefs uh, from those from those uh, groups. So they will they'll probably I'm hoping they'll begin to uh, really come to the forefront and showcase the food of, of their uh, of their background and their ancestry. Chef Ashford, uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor uh, to to view your presentation. I sure I, I speak for everybody viewing this. It has been uh, an enlightening experience, you know, to learn and to see you. So thank you, Chef, uh, for that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to pass it over to Jackie uh, for our closing remarks and uh, and any information moving forward. Thank you. Well, thank you and a huge virtual round of applause as we she uh, thank Chef Ashford um, and thank you for moderating Chef Ashton. Uh, and of course, thank you uh, to Chobani as well for uh, being our sponsor. We appreciate you taking the time to share and I really wish I was there to taste that delicious red red. Oh my gosh. Um, so well, hopefully, hopefully soon, Jack. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Thank you. Um, and ACF is listening to what you want to see and learn. Uh, we hope that you will join us tomorrow as we also partner with the Club Management Association of America to discuss the future of buffets and also for a chance to chat with NASA about culinary nutrition on March 2nd in collaboration with Massachusetts ProStar. To register for upcoming webinars or for more inspiration, please check out our new site, wearechefs.com and search for webinars. And we can't wait to see you soon. So also please mark your calendars. ACF National Convention will be in Orlando, August 2nd through 5th, and we hope to see you there. Um, so again, on behalf of the ACF National Office, thank you so much, Chef Ashford, um, and thank you all for joining us today. See you soon. Thank you, guys. Bye, Chef. See you later. See you later, Ashford.